Okay. Um, so last time we had um, we had left matters at a place where we were hoping to compute the average sizes of the n Selma groups of elliptic curves over Q, where these for, for, for small values of n, namely n equals two, three, four, and five. However, I did not define the n Selma group. So we're gonna do that today. But, but first we're gonna talk in some generality. Um, so let, so let K be a field. So let's begin with the following setup. So let K be a field. Uh, we'll, assume it's a, it's, we'll assume it's a perfect field. Um, so the algebraic closure will denote by K bar. Now, um, we're going to use, we're going to basically use everything we talk about for when K is Q and when K is, some completion of Q, namely it's QP for some P or, or, or the real numbers. Okay, so, but in this setup, suppose E is an elliptic curve. Over K. And suppose N greater than or equal to two is an integer. Then we begin with the following exact sequence. So we'll take the multiplication by n map on the k bar points of E. So this is going to be surjective. And the kernel is precisely the n torsion. Of E. Okay. And now if you take Galois cohomology, we get the exact sequence zero goes to EK mod NEK goes to H1 K EN, this is the connecting map which then goes to H1KE and in fact, it surjects onto the n torsion of H1KE. So this is very similar to the um, setup we started off with, with I mean, the, this, this, this group EK mod NEK also mapped into the Selma group, which mapped into the N torsion in the Tate Shafirovich group. And basically what we're going to do uh, is, is, is construct the Selma group as a subgroup of this when K is Q and, and that's, what, that's what we'll be using. But first, because I mean, EK mod NEK is really what we want to study. So let's try and understand these cohomology groups a little bit better. And to understand these cohomology groups better, we're going to use a twisting principle and this twisting principle is i mean i mean the way i stated it's not going to be true for, for for everything but it's going to be true for all the objects that we consider and here's here's the twisting principle suppose x is an algebraic object of some sort, you'll see, you will see many examples, but suppose X is an algebraic object defined over K, then H1 K automorphism groups of X. So the H1 of the automorphism group of X should essentially be, I mean, this is, it's, it's, it's going to inject into, into twists of, of a, uh, it's going to, I mean, there's, there's, there's a map from twists of X into H1, but, but in all the cases, it's going to be a bijection between this H1 group and what are called twists 
of x. And what do I mean by a twist of x? I mean an object y, which is also defined over k, such that there's an isomorphism from y to x, but this isomorphism only is defined over k bar. And this is a sort of very general principle that's of great use all over arithmetic statistics. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a way to get you to, to, to understand these, you know, to get more concrete versions of these cohomology groups. So we want to understand these cohomology groups in terms of twists of certain algebraic objects. So of course, what we're really interested in is H1, K, E, N. But before that, let's understand H1, K, E. Let's try and figure out what H1, K, E is using our twisting principle. So I have to tell you what the base object is. And the base object is going to have an automorphism group, which is going to be isomorphic to E. And, um, and therefore, the, therefore, using our twisted principles, it will turn out that, that, that twisted versions of our base object are exactly, um, uh, is, it, is, is in bijection with H1, K, E. So here's the base object. So the base object are, so I mean, like we would like to just take E itself, but as you know, the automorphism groups of, of E doesn't have to be E. I mean, um, E is certainly contained in the automorphism groups of E because given a point in E, you translate. Translation gives automorphisms of E. However, they can be extra automorphisms. And so in order to eliminate the extra automorphisms, what we do is we add some structure. We don't just take E, but we take E and we remove, uh, sorry, and, and we remember the addition on E. So, so a base object is going to be E along with addition, remembering the structure of addition. And then the twists are going to be what are called torsors. The twists are what are going to be called torsors for E. And so, so that, is basically a pair C comma mu, where C is a genus one curve. Defined over K, C is going to be isomorphic, isomorphic as curves sorry, uh, to E, but this will only be defined over K bar. And mu, is going to give you, so mu is a morphism defined again over K, which is going to uh, give you an action of E on C, such that mu gives us a simply transitive action of E on C, on the level of K bar points. Okay. So, so that's what, that's what a torsor is. Now, two torsors are said to be isomorphic if there's a morphism between them defined over K. Respecting the action of an isomorphism, respecting the action of E. So it needs to have an inverse. Okay. So now, suppose L is any field 
containing k and suppose c of l has a point so suppose c has a point in l suppose it contains a point p not then i can define a map from e to c which sends the identity element to p not and in general sends any element p of e to simply mu p comma p not this is going to be an isomorphism of torsus So basically over L, E plus is isomorphic to C mu. And this gives us the following very crucial theorem. A torsor is trivial over K, let's say. And when I say trivial, I mean it should be isomorphic to the base object E and plus. So it's trivial if and only if C has a point defined over k okay now it's easy to see that the automorphism group of e which respects addition is exactly e the only automorphisms are translations by points in E. And so what we get is that H1KE is a natural bijection with torsors of E. Okay. So hopefully all of that was clear. If you have any questions, please, please don't hesitate to ask. But um, if this is if this is good, then I'll move on to to talking about H one E N. Great. So what we've done so far is we have this we have this exact sequence, and we've described what objects in H1KE look like. Is the definition of torsor uh, designed in such a way that you can tell that over K bar, the action of, uh, of E on C co uh, coincides with the addition law on E? So, I mean, I mean, yeah, yeah. I think what you what are you saying essentially boils down to the fact that the automorphisms of E, or uh, the automorphisms of E comma plus, are exactly the translations. So over mm -hmm. K bar, absolutely. So over K bar, um, C has a point which is isomorphic to E plus, and uh, you can get many different isomorphisms because you can take any point inside C and map zero to that point and. And, and, and they correspond exactly, the, the isomorphisms correspond exactly to the automorphisms of E plus, which are, uh, which is, which is E. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. So, I mean, the, the, the whole thing is, the whole thing about DOS is you just remember this addition so that you kill any extra automorphisms and you're left only with the translations. Great, great question. Thank you. Okay. So after having discussed H1KE, and you should remember this result, which is a very crucial one. It sort of guides a lot of uh, thinking about like why certain things are difficult. Like, like the reason, so for example, so when K is Q, the reason it's very difficult to understand the Tate-Shafirovich group is because it all boils down to asking whether or not torsors are trivial. You, you need to understand whether an element, uh, whether a torsor is trivial. And to answer that question, you have to basically determine whether a genus one curve has a rational point. If K is Q, you're asking for a rational point. And it's very hard to tell in general whether a curve has a rational point or not. 
because that point could be really far away for all we know. Okay. But having, having hopefully understood H1KE to some extent, let's move on to H1KEN. Now, how do we understand H1KEN? Well, we want an object whose automorphism group is EN. That will tell us, and its twists will give us H1KEN by our twisting principle. So I'm going to give you, so I actually recommend this very beautiful paper by Cremona, Fisher, O'Neill, Simon, and Stoll. And it's called, if I remember correctly, Explicit End Descent on elliptic curves one. In which they give a whole lot of examples of objects whose automorphism group is EN. And they also describe how you can go in between, how you can use one, how you can use the other, how they all correspond to each other and so on and so forth. It's beautifully written, very clear, uh, highly recommended. And I'm taking examples from them. I'm not going to do all of what they did. I'm just going to take, I'm going to take three examples. So the first one, as you might have guessed, I mean, to make an object whose automorphism group was E, we took an E torsor. So here we'll take an EN torsor. So the first one is, is EN torsors where the base object is simply EN and you remove, and you remember addition. So that, as you can, by, by the sort of same arguments that we gave before, I mean, this, this has automorphism group, uh, this, 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 this base object has automorphism group EN. And so twists of EN comma plus is going to give you, is going to parameterize H1KEN. Over oh, twists of EN plus, they're not easy to work with. They're not easy to construct. We, it's not, they're not as explicit as we want. So I'll take some other examples. So the most classical example is N coverings of elliptic curves, but, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to actually um, talk about those. I'll use ones that are slightly more convenient for us. So here's, here's a beautiful, beautiful way to make an object whose automorphism group is, is EN. So we're going to take a torsor of E along with a divisor class. Of degree N. So the base object here is a torsor of E. So you've got E and plus, that's the trivial torsor. And then you also want a degree N divisor class. So we'll take the divisor class N times O. So this is the base object. And a twist is simply a torsor of E along with a degree n divisor class. So it's a K rational degree n divisor class. Now, what is the automorphism group? So we, this is the one that we'll be using. So what's the automorphism group of this object. 
Well, first of all, any automorphism has to be an automorphism of, it has to be the realistic to an automorphism of the torsor itself. So the only options, so the only options are translations. If you take a point P in E, you can translate by that point. Okay. But this translation has to provide, has to, has to preserve this divisor class. So what does this translation do? So instead of NO, you get the divisor class corresponding to NP. That's what translation by P does. It takes O to P. And so instead of the divisor class NO, you get the divisor class NP. And we know that NP is equivalent to NO as divisor classes. If and only if N times P as a point in the elliptic curve is the identity. So this is true if and only if P is an EN. So therefore, the automorphism group of this is simply EN as, as required. And so this, this triple, a torsor along with a degree N divisor class, these triples rather, sorry, C, mu, D, these triples parametrize elements in H1, K, E, N. Okay. So another way to think about this, this is basically equivalent data that I'll give you, are brower severi diagrams. Namely, you take a torsor of E and a degree N map to a twist of Pn minus 1. So the base object is simply E, I'm going to repress the plus, but we think of E as a trivial torsor of itself, mapping to Pn minus one. And the twists are genus one curves. So C is going to be an E torsor. which maps to S, which is some twist of Pn minus one. And tying this, tying this back, so two and three are easily seen to be equivalent. I'll tell you once you have two, what's the EN torsor that you get? Because I mean, these are all essentially, they're all parameterizing the same object, right? EN torsors, torsor divisor class, brower severi diagrams. They're all parameterizing H1 K E N. So in some, they should all correspond to each other. And given a pair CD, where C is a torsor of an elliptic curve and D is a degree and divisor class, The corresponding twist of EN is the set of flex points of C, which is to say it's a set of all points in C um, such that the divisor class n times p is linearly equivalent to. So that's a very beautiful way in which you can see the twist of En arising this way. And it's very nice. So like, for example, what was our map? What was our thing? Our thing was Ek mod Nek maps to H1 Ken 
maps to H1 Ke. And if I take something here, let's say I take either an element represented by a torso divisor class or an element represented by a Brouwer Severy diagram. What does it map to here? Well, it's just, you just forget the divisor class, you just forget the map, you just keep the torso. And that's what's represented by the image of this element. So if sigma here maps to theta here, and sigma is represented by CD, then theta will be represented by C. If sigma is represented by the map C to S, theta will be represented by C. So it's all very natural and beautiful. Okay. So there we have it. We have almost everything that we need. Um, sorry, we have we have we have what we need. We have we have our map. We have ways of representing H one elements in H one K E N. We have ways of representing elements in H one K E. And now we can try and understand the situation over Q and try and isolate the difficulties that could arise. So let's consider the situation over the rational numbers. Everything I say is going to work for any number field or any function field, but I'll stick to Q for simplicity. I mean, it's, it's really the same. It's mostly notational simplicity that I'm going for. Okay, so over Q, what do we have? We have zero goes to EQ mod NEQ. And if you remember EQ mod NEQ, because I mean, E of Q is finitely generated, EQ mod NEQ is going to control the rank of E. But this is mapping to H1Q EN. This is mapping to H1QE N. And we want to understand this object. So the first thing you might say is, well, we've mapped it to H1QEN. So why don't we just study H1QEN instead? The problem is H1QEN is going to be infinite. So we're not going to be able to understand anything with the size of EQ mod NEQ by looking at the whole H1QEN. That's just far too big. That's infinite. Okay. So why don't we then study only those elements in H1QEN that map to the trivial element in H1QE? That will give us exactly what EQ mod NEQ is. But there's a problem there as well. Because you see, if an element in H1QEN is represented by a Brouwer Severy diagram or a torsor divisor class pair, then its image in H1QE is just a torsor of E. And to determine whether or not it's trivial is to try and understand whether or not this curve C, this random genus one curve has a rational point. And it's very difficult to understand whether curves have rational points. And so the strategy of studying elements, of, of studying the rank through just understanding elements in H1QEN that map to the trivial element in H1QE is a very difficult one. So this is basically models innovation in some sense, I think. Maybe I have the history wrong, but I think this idea is due to model, though not stated quite as in quite as polished a form, but essentially what you do instead is you map it, you consider not just the situation over Q, but you also consider the situation over all completions of Q. So you take the product over all places of Q and look at EQV mod NEQV. And just, I mean, everything we said previously worked over any field, in particular, it works over all these QVs. So we have this. And in particular, 
we get a map from here to here. Let's call that map pi. And now we're ready to define our N-Selma group. The N-Selma group of E is by definition the kernel of pi. So what did we gain by this? Well, first of all, suppose we have an element in EQ, EN that's represented by a browse every diagram, C goes to S. Then its image in H1, Q, V, E is simply C, the torsor C, but considered as a torsor over Q, V. And we are interested in the kernel of pi. So we want to understand when an element is trivial in H1, Q, V, E. So a torsor is trivial in H1, Q, V, E if and only if C has a point over Q, V. Determining whether or not a curve has a point locally is quite an easy matter. You can understand the situation over FP. Basically, most of the time, you can understand the situation over FP and lift using Hensel's lemma. So this is a much easier question to deal with. So on the one hand, we've made our group bigger. We've made our group strictly bigger because instead of demanding that we look for brower severi uh, diagrams with trivial C over Q, we just see C doesn't have to be trivial over Q, but C has to be trivial over all QV. And that's a much easier condition to get your hands on. On the other hand, we also have the advantage that the Selma group is finite. So we've taken a, a chunk out of H1 Q E N, but it's a finite chunk. And understanding it doesn't require us to understand whether curves have points if globally, we only have to understand whether curves have points locally. So that makes the Selma group, the N Selma group, a sort of wonderful intermediate object through which to study the rank. Okay. So now that we've defined the N-Selma group, let me talk about how it's parameterized, how we actually can write down elements in the N-Selma group explicitly for these small values of N. So we do it using the browser severi diagrams. So if you have an element in the n Selma group, then this can be represented by a degree n map. We know this because the n Selma group sits inside H1 QEN. So we know that this can be represented by a browser severi map where C is a torsor of E. and S is a twist of P1. However, we've assumed that sigma is not just an H1 QEN, but rather in, cell, in the N Selma group of P. So what does that buy us? So that condition implies that C has a point everywhere locally. Which means automatically, that S has a point everywhere locally. However, if you have a twist of P1, which has a point everywhere locally, then it must be, sorry, it's not P1, P1 this is Pn minus one, my apologies. But if you have a twist of Pn minus one, which has a point everywhere locally, then it must have a point globally, which means it must be Pn minus one itself. So in particular, 
we can represent an element in the Enselma group by a much simpler Brouwer Severi diagram. It's a torsor of E mapping into Pn minus one. And this is going to be a degree N map. Okay. So let's understand what happens in the low degree cases. So when N is equal to two, this was the theory, this entire theory was worked out by Birch and Sunit and Dyer. To actually use this correspondence to actually explicitly compute the two Selma groups of elliptic curves using which they computed the ranks of elliptic curves and with that data they formulated the BSD conjecture. And so when n is equal to 2 you get a genus 1 curve with a degree 2 map to p1 so this is a double cover. So it's a double cover of P1 ramified at four points. So in particular, C can be represented by the equation Z squared equals F of X comma Y, where F of X comma Y is a binary quartic form with coefficients in Q. So it's of the form AX to the four plus BX cubed Y plus CX squared Y squared plus DX Y cubed plus EY to the four. A, B, C, D, E are rational numbers. So that's the connection between elements in the two Selma groups of an elliptic curve and binary quartic forms. Given an element in the, given an elliptic curve and an element in its two Selma group, you can produce a binary quartic form. Moreover, this binary quartic form corresponds to an element in a two Selma corresponds to an element in the two Selma group. Exactly if this curve has points everywhere locally, which means if this binary quartic form represents a square everywhere locally, then it's an element in the two Selma group. And it comes from the image of an actual honest point. It comes from the image of something in EQ mod 2 EQ, exactly when C is a trivial torsor, which is to say, this should have a rational point. So in fact, before I move on to n equal to three, let me just write down, let me just say, so if we have an element, so if we have sigma in the two Selma group of an elliptic curve, then you can take sigma and you can produce a binary quartic form with coefficients in Q such that F of X comma Y represents a square everywhere locally. And that is just, and, and when that happens, we say F of X comma Y is locally soluble. Moreover, sigma is in the image of EQ mod 2 EQ if and only if f of x comma y represents a square over Q. 
which is to say f of x comma y must take a square value. So for example, if the x to the four coefficient was simply one, if a was one, then it does represent a square. Namely, you can take x to be one and y to be zero. So that would be an example of a soluble binary quantity. But in general, it's very hard to tell whether a binary quartic represents a square over Q. But you know, so if it represents a square over Q, uh, and then then we say f of x comma y is soluble. So the four ramification points are exactly the four roots of f of x comma y. So the twist of E2 that we should be getting, if you think of the element in H1, E2, as an E2 tosser, is the set of roots of f. So in particular, sigma corresponds to the identity element in the two Selma group, if and only if f of x comma y has a rational root. So in particular, it must be reducible. So as you can see, this is all wonderfully explicit. Okay, so let me then continue with the other lower degree cases. So when n is equal to three, when n is greater than or equal to three, this map from C to Pn minus one is going to be an embedding. So we have an embedding, a degree three embedding of C into P2 and genus one curves in P2 are cut out exactly by ternary cubic forms. Where f of x comma y comma z is a ternary cubic form with coefficients in Q. When n is equal to four, you're looking for C, an embedding of C into P3, and such C are cut out by the intersection of two quadratic forms. So you need a Q1 of X, Y, Z, W, and a Q2 of X, Y, Z, W, and the zero set, uh, the, the, the common zeros is going to be a genus one curve. When N is equal to five, things get significantly more difficult. Because if you want to cut out a genus one curve inside P4, you have to do it with five quadratic forms. Now, unfortunately, if you generically take five quadratic forms, they won't intersect at all. They'll have an empty intersection. So you need to understand what are the set of five quadrics that intersect in a genus one curve. Take five quadrics in P4. When do they intersect in a genus one curve? And this was understood by Boxbaum Eisenberg to give a really beautiful characterization of how you get these quadratic forms. Namely, what you do is you take five alternating five cross five matrices. So 
A, B, C, D, and E. And then you look at A, X plus B, Y plus C, Z plus D, S plus E, T. So that's a five cross five alternating matrix of linear forms. And then you take its five Fafians. Each Fafian is going to be a quadratic form in X, Y, Z, S, and T. You take its five Fafians and they will intersect in the genus one curve. And moreover, every genus one curve can be cut out by the five Fafians of a set of five alternating five cross five matrices over Q. So that's, that's the theory when N is equal to five. Okay, so now I'm going to, so, so we've, we've kind of understood the connection between two Selma elements and binary quadric forms, three Selma elements and ternary cubic forms, four Selma elements and pairs of quaternary quadratic forms, and five Selma elements and sets of five alternating five cross five mates. And um, this is due to, I mean, like this, a lot of this theory is classical over the complex numbers. This has been understood classically. And um, Birch and Spinet and Dyer, Castles, Boxbaum, Eisenberg, a lot of people have worked out the theory over Q. Uh, but the theorem, as I stated in this particular form, with the exact groups, the exact representations, and the exact automorphism groups, this is, I'm going to, uh, this is, in this form, it's due to Manjul Bhargava and Wei Ho. So, I'm going to start with the group G2, which is PGL2, acting on V2, which is a space of binary quartic forms. G3 is going to be PGL3, acting on V3, which is a space of ternary cubic forms. G4. I'm not going to describe it exactly, but it's a semi-simple group and it's a quotient of a subgroup. I don't know, a quotient of a subgroup of GL2 cross GL4 acting on V4, which is the space of pairs of quaternary quadratic forms. Well, G5 is going to be a quotient of a subgroup of GL5 cross GL5 acting on V5, which is the space of five alternating five cross elements. Now in each case, and I should have said this before, these representations, again, they come naturally from this. They've been studied classically. And it was known that in each case, The invariant theory for GN, so this is a little bit out of order, but that's fine. So the invariant theory, so N here, of course, is two, three, four, five. So the invariant theory for GN acting on VN is very nice. So the polynomial invariance for this action, polynomial invariants are freely generated. by two elements, which we will call A and B. I'm not going to normalize them correctly. You have to be a, you have to be a little bit careful with the normalization, but it turns out to not really be that important. So I'm going to ignore all normalization issues, but, but I'll just suffice to say that, yes, the polynomial invariants are freely generated by this A and B. So in particular, this representation is called co-regular because uh, the ring of invariance is freely generated. 
And now here's the statement of the theorem. Suppose E A B is an elliptic curve over Q. Remember, we have written E A B as you know, as we've written all elliptic curves as E A B, where A and B are integers. The discriminant is non-zero. And P to the four dividing A implies P to the six does not divide B. And that was a way to write down every elliptic curve over Q. So let's take one of them, E A B. Then the n Selma group of E A B is in bijection with, so we'll take V N Q, but we won't take everything inside V N Q. We'll only take those elements which have invariants A and P, and we'll quotient out with action of G N Q. And this is not quite right. This is not quite right. We have to take locally soluble elements. If you'll remember, all elements had to be locally soluble. So for example, in the binary quartic case, we already saw what it means to be locally soluble. It means a binary quartic form has to represent a square everywhere locally. In a ternary cubic case, it's some other complicated, I mean, not, not complicated, it's a very simple thing. It's we have f x comma y comma z that cuts out a curve over QP and over R, it needs to have a point. Similarly, for n equal to four and n equal to five, there's a notion of local solubility. And then the N-Selma group of EAB is a natural bijection with the locally soluble elements in V and Q having invariants A and B, uh, but G and Q orbits of it. G and Q, of course, preserves A and B because A and B are invariants for the action. So this is the first result. There's an analog of this locally as well. EQV mod NEQV is in bijection with VNQV, again, soluble in QV. Moreover, like suppose K is either Q or QV, doesn't matter. In fact, this is true for any field K. And suppose I have an element inside V and Q with um, invariance A and B. And I ask, what is the stabilizer of V in G and Well, this is naturally isomorphic to the n torsion points defined over k. So that's the statement of the main parameterization theorem which is to say that you have, we have these representations. We have G2 acting on V2, G3 acting on V3, G4 acting on V4, and G5 acting on V5. So first of all, given an elliptic curve of a Q, we can parameterize the n Selma group of, of this elliptic curve in terms of G and Q orbits on V and Q. And moreover, we have this explicit definition. We have this explicit description of what the stabilizers are. So this is a wonderful result, but Q orbits are not easy to handle. It's not very easy to understand elements inside V and Q. There are just too many of them. We would like elements in V and Z. And luckily, there is a result for that as well. So this is due to many people. So when n is equal to two, this is due to Birch and Swinnett and Dyer. But 
when n is equal to 3 and 4, it's due to Cremona, Fisher, and Stoll. And when n is equal to 5, it's due to Stoll. Sorry, it's due to Fisher. This is an amazing theorem. What it says is that suppose I have an element inside V and Q having invariance A and B and which is locally soluble. And suppose in addition that A and B are integers. To be perfectly honest, you've got to assume also that A and B are sufficiently divisible by 2, 3, 4, and 5, but I'm going to normalize it so that they automatically are. So suppose V in V and Q is locally soluble with invariants that are integral, then the Q orbit of V has an integral point. The Q orbit of V is always going to have an integral point, which means when we are studying this thing, we don't have to look inside all of V and Q. It suffices to focus our attention on V and Z. So as a consequence of the above two results, what we see is that the N-Selma group is in bijection with V and Z take elements A, B that are locally soluble. And I'm just going to write quotiented out by G and Q, but obviously it's not actually a quotient because G and Q won't preserve integrality, but I mean equivalence classes where two elements are equivalent if there's an element of G and Q that takes one to another. So that's where we'll end today. We've obtained a parameterization of these N-Selma groups. And what we're going to do next time, which is tomorrow, we will count G and Z orbits on V and Z. We will forget this condition of local solubility. We will pretend that it's not actually G and Q equivalence classes, but rather G and Z orbits that we're counting and just count those. But for now, I'll stop and uh, see if there are any questions. Thank uh, Arul. Uh, all right, are there any questions? Could you hear that, Arun? No, I'm afraid not at all. Uh, what is the local solubility in the n equal to that matrix case explicitly? Oh, we don't have an explicit description for it. That's an excellent question. But I mean, I'm sorry, I, I don't know of an explicit description for it at all. It's just, it's, it's, it's something complicated. Something very complicated. Um, I mean, I mean, just, I mean, by definition, all it means is that, I mean, this, you have this complicated, you have this, you have this set of five alternating matrices. You take their, you make a linear, you make an alternating matrix of linear forms. You take the five Fafians, you get five quadratic forms. The Fafians are each quadratic form. So you've got five quadratic forms. You intersect them. And then you get a genus one curve inside P4. And you're locally soluble if it has a point. And we just, I, I certainly don't know of any clean way of, of, of determining whether something is locally soluble. But we won't need it. As you'll see, our proof is going to it's going to do a counting argument in which we won't actually need to know any of these explicit, any of these sort of explicit things. What we will use instead 
is this is this bijection because you're right we don't want to understand all of v and q p we only want to understand the locally soluble elements inside v and q p just to be clear the local solubility in r is very simple it's always locally soluble it's answer in r over r it's always locally soluble but okay so over q p we want to understand we want to understand we 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 don't want all elements in v and q we only want locally soluble elements so in particular when we when we when we take an element and we look at it as an element of qp we want to understand whether it has a point over qp and that's you can't do that explicitly it's too complicated however what we do know is that g and qp orbits on the locally soluble elements are in bijection with this very explicit set it's in bijection with eqp mod 5 eqp and that's something that we can understand so even though we won't be able to say exactly what the condition for local solubility is we will need only two things about it first of all we will need to know that it's defined by congruence conditions but that's obvious like of course it's defined by congruence conditions because it's some qp property the second thing is that we need to understand the density of elements inside qp that are soluble and the way we will understand that density is through this bijection I see. Mm. Thanks. Thanks That's a lot. Great question. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, okay. Let's thank Arul again. Thank you very much.